Welcome, Travis Walton. Thanks for coming. Uh, how many people uh, saw the movie? Well, I guess by now you probably realize that um, they uh, got a little creative there and changed some things. But uh, I am looking to, uh, in the future, possibly getting a remake of the movie and getting them to uh, uh, tell it how it really happened. But for now, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> November 5th, 1975, uh, a day that changed my life forever. I uh, was working in the woods with a crew of uh, six other guys. There were seven of us all together. In the movie, they only had six. But uh, we put in a long day, and uh, it's starting to get dark. We loaded up our equipment, and we're headed home. Uh, we're driving along this uh, rough uh, dirt road, and uh, everybody was talking away. In the movie, they, it looked like everybody was kind of dozing off, but we hadn't gone very long, very far down the road, and so, uh, you know, we were wide awake. We'd just recently been, uh, you know, doing vigorous physical work, and so our senses were as awake as you can get. And uh, I, I noticed this light up uh, to our right. The, the road we were on was... Uh, paralleling the, the ridge, going south back up towards the rim road. And uh, the, uh, the crest of the ridge was to our right and a little you know, higher than, than the road itself. Uh, but when I noticed these, uh, this uh, light coming through the trees, um, it wasn't like immediately it was so alarming that everybody said, what's that? You know, it's, uh, you know, I was looking, and before I said anything to anybody else, uh, one by one, all these little conversations that were going on amongst the crew dropped off, and everybody was looking in the same direction. And uh, uh, we were wondering what that was, and um, it was deer hunting season, so I thought that maybe there was some hunter's camp there. But uh, the light was coming from uh, higher than where ground level would be, uh, so, uh, it was, I could see a, a break in the trees up ahead where the light was coming across the road. Uh, so, uh, I urged Mike to, you know, hurry up, get up there so we can see, you know, what's going on because people are saying, what is that? And, and uh, you know, th this is part of the movie where they were fairly accurate. Um, as soon as... Uh, we got to where that light was crossing the road. Um, there it was. It was unmistakable. This this object was hovering less than a hundred feet away. You know, the, the the skeptics were later saying, "Oh, they saw the planet Jupiter and uh, stupid things like that." Didn't look anything like swamp gas. This was a distinct metallic object hovering less than a hundred feet away. Um, Alan Dallas uh, yelled out, it's a flying saucer, and I called for Mike to stop the truck. Um, because I was thinking, you know, this is an you know, incredible thing, but, you know, so often when we're in the woods and um, you, you caught sight of a, a, a deer or bear or something, you'd you know, call the, the rest of the crew attention to it, and before they could even look, it'd be gone. You know, they might not even see what you saw. So. That's kind of what I was thinking when I threw open the door and started towards it. I thought it would be gone before I got very close. Uh, it was kind of a brazen act, all right. And, and uh, you know, the guys in the, uh, the truck were uh, uh, pretty alarmed by what I was doing and, and started yelling at me almost immediately to, uh, you know, come back to the truck. And... Uh, uh, myself, I was uh, wrestling with some misgivings about what I was doing because uh, it, it didn't leave like I expected it to. <laughs> and so I was kind of stuck with that one. Uh, there's the crew. 
Mike, Ken Peterson, Alan Dallas, the black sheep, been in and out of trouble ever since. I heard recently that he's back in trouble. <laughs> but uh, there's Dwayne Smith and uh, John Glad. I recently um, had him on an interview with me on the NBC Today show uh, back on the 12th of this month. And they did a, a pretty pretty fair job of it. And uh, anybody that saw that, you know, I'd encourage everybody to please get in touch with the Today Show and, and uh, express some appreciation for having uh, got it right for a change because, uh, you know, the media needs encouragement when they, when they get it right because uh, so often they've got to have that little snicker at the end or some sort of a negative slant. But anyway, and then... Uh, on the bottom right was uh, Steve Pierce. I hadn't heard from him in uh, many years, back since right after it happened, and he got in touch with me uh, uh, here last year and, and uh, was interested in talking about it again. Uh, I've, I've been trying to uh, find uh, Dwayne Smith and uh, Alan Dallas again. Uh, you know, to get their, um, pardon me, their current um, perspectives on things. But, you know, as recently as when I talked to them last, along about the time the movie was made, everybody was, um, you know, had pretty much come to terms with what happened to us. Anyway, um, Crew truck, double cab truck, that's how seven people fit in one truck. Um, this is a part of the state where it happened. Pretty rugged back country at that time. I may as well tell you about that right there. This is kind of a coincidence. Found this uh, map. Um, it a topographical map, it, uh, it divided up the state into all these different areas. And uh, just one of the many coincidences surrounding this incident, um, the area that they uh, designated for where this happened was Area 51. <laughs> uh, go figure. <laughs> maybe, maybe the map, a map maker's idea of a, of a joke, but... Uh, this is how it looked to me when I got up close to it. And it was incredible, an incredible sight. And, and uh, John Gallet here on the, uh, the Today Show that just aired uh, uh, remarked about how to him uh, it looked so perfect. You know, he said it was like a new Corvette. You know, it was, uh, when I, I was just standing there in awe of this thing looking up at it. It was uh, metallic in some areas and glowing in other areas. What you see on the bottom of it here looking up at this angle, there are reflections of the trees and everything. But it was smooth like glass, uh, but this light kind of lit up everything with kind of a strange sort of a, a glow. It gave a kind of a strange feeling. The sound it was making um, was uh, really very difficult to describe because there was a sort of a a rumble, a real deep a rumble that you, you know, could almost feel more than, uh, than hear. And the same thing with the higher notes, they were like off the range of human hearing. So, you know, those kind of sounds, when you turn your head, it doesn't change that much, which gives a kind of a, where's this coming from, kind of a strange feeling. But uh, when I got up close, the guys were really getting uh, very anxious and uh, swearing at me and telling me to get away from there. And uh, it suddenly got louder and it started to move. It was kind of with a little rocking motion as it rose up. And uh, that scared me uh, uh, more than I was already scared. But um, there was this pile of logging debris. And that was the reason I had stopped. I got about as close as I could looking up at it. Uh, without, uh, you know, running over this big pile of uh, logs. And uh, so when, the, when it started to move, I jumped down behind uh, a log there and uh, 
they were saying, run, get, you know, get out of here, let's go, let's go. And I didn't need to be told. I was, I was trying to figure out, you know, how to get to safety and, and leave the relative safety of the cover behind the log. But I was down in a crouch, and I raised up to sprint back to the truck. And, and at that moment, bam, it, it, it was just like, uh, like I'd been hit and didn't see it coming, you know. It was a, really a kind of a stunning blow sort of a feeling. Uh, just like numbness really quickly spread through me and, and I blacked out. But the crew said uh, that it was like this beam came out of the bottom of this craft and hit me, but it was like, a, like I'd stepped on a landmine or like a, like a grenade had gone off. And uh, the explosion threw me back through the air. Uh, I've been saying it uh, threw me back 10 feet, but you know, Steve, when he called me up, he was saying, no, it was 20 feet. But whatever it was, they, they said that um, it looked to them the way, you know, I didn't protect myself when I hit that, and the way my body was limp that they thought it had killed me. And they, you know, were yelling as much back and forth to each other and, and screaming at Mike to get them out of there. And uh, so they took off. Uh, and, uh, you know, in a lot of talks, uh, I've run into people who uh, have, uh, you know, sort of disparaged the crew for not standing their ground there. But I always uh, want to add that... Um, you know, I find no fault with these guys for having taken off like that because, you know, they thought I was dead and they thought I was next. They were next, and and so, you know, what good would it do them to to get themselves killed rescuing somebody who's already dead? So, it's perfectly understandable. Um, they took off, dang near wrecked the truck several times getting away from there, and uh, they. Uh, they, once they got close to the rim road, they'd stop briefly, but they said that they uh, caught sight of some hunters and, and went trying to catch the truck and see if they could get some people with some guns to help them. I guess even then they knew that they were going to have to go back and, and see what they could do. Uh, they were unable to catch the deer hunters, so they, they did return to the site. and. Uh, They uh, uh, had a lot of fear, you know, approaching it. Uh, somebody said they saw, um, they thought they saw the object leaving, but it was only when they actually got there that they, you know, confirmed that it didn't seem to be there anymore. But then neither was I, and they, they said they made a search at one point. Uh, Mike, you know, really fell to his knees and broke down crying, and uh, Ken helped him up, and they, they kind of, they stayed in a real tight bunch trying to make a search. Uh, they only had one flashlight, and they were all just huddled together trying to, you know, do what they had to do, trying to, trying to see if they could rescue me. And I give those guys a lot of credit for that, but uh, they were unable to find me, so they, uh, they went, um, uh, back to town, and they argued about <coughs> what to do, and uh, um, Alan didn't want to go to the authorities right away. He, he figured that they ought to just go get some friends with some guns and come back, make a search, and then, then if they couldn't find anything, report it, but uh, Mike and Ken said, no, we got to, we gotta, you know, what if Travis is never found? You know, how'll that look if we if we don't go report it right away. So they called the uh, local deputy and he came down and he called the sheriff in. And uh, The sheriff said that he was immediately struck with the, uh, that these guys had been through something really traumatic. But uh, apparently all the lawmen, being lawmen, um, suspected that, uh, that there had been some foul play and that this was just a cover story for why no one was going to see me again. So uh, 
unlike in the movie, they did go back with half the crew uh, to make a search that night. And again, I, I give those guys credit for that. Uh, but the real manhunt began the next morning. The, the sheriff uh, got together, you know, over 50 uh, uh, volunteers and, and the, the, the sheriff's posse and deputies and Forest Service people, search and rescue teams. And, uh, they uh, had a very organized search in which they combed uh, the entire area on foot. Um, they had men on horseback, or there was four-wheel drives. Uh, the tracking dogs were brought in at one point. Uh, they had um, airplanes and helicopters crisscrossing the area. And uh, during this time, and in my recent conversation with John, he was saying that what, they, what the lawmen did is they separated the, the crew up, and uh, as the crew were helping with the search, one deputy uh, or officer with each of the men, and they were basically all pushing the men to confess to the murder, you know. John said, he says, come on, just, just tell us what really happened so we can all go home and, you know, get this over with. And, but uh, so the men got you know, really tired of the accusations and uh, they said, we'll, we'll take any test you want. So give us sodium pentothal lie detector tests. And we'll, uh, we're telling the truth. We did not kill him. We saw what we saw. And uh, so uh, the sheriff heard about that. and. Um, set up a, a lie detector test with the uh, uh, state police, uh, Department of Public Safety a polygraph examiner, came up and uh, tested all the men there at the, at the jail, at the courthouse. And uh, so when they passed, uh, <coughs> it was uh, new theories. And uh, people were desperate to explain this away any way they could. Theories that um, all the men were hallucinating on drugs, uh, that I'd had a transitory psychosis, that that the the hypnotist that I saw later had um, implanted memories. But I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here. Uh, the first thing I recall after um, being hit by the beam was uh, waking up real slowly. I was in a lot of pain. Uh, I was in and out of consciousness for quite a while. I don't, I don't know how long, but I didn't know where I was at first. And, uh, and then, you know, I remembered uh, approaching the object, and I thought that maybe I'd been hurt somehow and that the crew had brought me to the hospital. So I assumed that I was in a hospital. I could feel they had this something across my chest and uh, I was on some kind of a raised surface, you know, a bed or a gurney or something, operating table, and I, and I hurt so bad and I was having trouble breathing, you know, I was, couldn't get enough air, I felt like I was suffocating. But uh, there was a light above me and I, I I didn't want to move too much because of the pain. I thought maybe I'd make things worse if I, if I moved, but I could hear the sounds of movement around me and I thought that these were just doctors. But, and I was having trouble focusing my eyes. This light above me was, wasn't all that bright, but it kind of hurt to, to, to look at it because you know the pain in my head and chest was pretty intense. And, uh, but I, I looked, uh, to my right, and I saw this face, and then I, 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 I could f focus on it, and uh, this was not a doctor, you know, I was looking into the face of this, uh, this creature, and I just, I just flipped out, you know. It, the, the surge of fear gave me enough strength to move, uh, but it was still very hard to move. I, I lifted my arm up to knock it away from me, but it was more of a push than anything. And he fell back into the other one. And it was, it was lighter and, and, and softer than I expected, but I was still just so terrified. And uh, a lot of people don't understand the degree of fear that I was experiencing, but uh, you, 
all these things combined to make me react negatively in a way far more uncontrollably than, than, than I probably would have had it not happened that way. See, I'm, I'm in all this pain, I'm struggling to breathe, it's dimly lit in a very small cramped room, it's humid and uh, um, you know, if you can't catch your breath, uh, that's probably the most panic-inducing thing that there is, and that's, that's why, you know, waterboarding is so effective at getting information out of terrorists, you know, because nothing, nothing will make you more afraid than that. It's on a very basic, instinctive level. But uh, when I rolled off the table and, and uh, staggered back away from them, they came around the table towards me, and uh, uh, I, uh, I, I fell back against the, um, there, was, there was kind of a um, workbench or a shelf, low shelf there against the, the back wall. And uh, they were coming towards me, so I just grabbed something off of that and I, and I struck out at them. Uh, they weren't close enough to hit, but I was just screaming threats and, and it must have worked because they stopped. They sort of extended their hands towards me. And uh, the, the most, the thing that really uh, stands out in my mind, the thing that uh, was the main feature of my nightmares for so long after that was those eyes, the way they looked at me. And these were not black obsidian eyes like you hear reported quite, uh, so often. Uh, uh, they, they had pupils and irises and, and eyelids because I, I saw them blink. And, uh, but the, the, their gaze, for some reason, it seemed like they were looking right into me in, in a really disturbing kind of way. It wasn't like the expression, they, they, there wasn't really much expression to their face. It wasn't frozen like a mask, but it, it still was a kind of a... Uh, a detached sort of look that, you know, I just, I just felt, it's really hard to describe uh, the emotion that that, that uh, caused in me. The, um, it's, it was just very disturbing. The, the, you know, we, we, when, when you're around somebody that you, you feel doesn't care about you one way or the other, they don't have to be hostile, we still kind of interpret that as negative, you know, as, as unfriendly. But uh, I was thinking about there was only one door, and it was beyond them. So I was thinking of how I could fight my way past them and uh, escape. But before I could move, they turned and went out the door. And there was this little passageway that went to the right. So, you know, I was afraid they'd come back, so I, I went to the door. And, and went to the left, just looking for a way out. Well, you know, I wasn't thinking clearly. I was in a total, just blind panic that uh, uh, there was no clear thought to it. I was thinking, open a door and get out. Uh, maybe in the back of my mind, I was thinking this thing was still in the woods and I could jump to the ground real easily, but uh, uh, it's probably a good thing I wasn't able to open a door. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that, pro that probably wasn't a. Uh, the best thing to do right at that time. But um, I went down this passageway and I was really kind of in this weird sort of a panic because I couldn't see very far up ahead. The, the, it curved to the right so far, I couldn't see very much bef in front of me or behind me. Uh, so I was, you know, kind of torn between sprinting away from what, uh, these creatures that I woke up to and and whatever freedom might, I might find ahead. But uh, I came to a, a door, and there was a room, and I could see you know, what I took to be doors, the outlines of doors on the other side, and uh, piecing together the floor plan of what I um, saw later, you know, I, I figured out that it, <clears throat> those probably, doors wouldn't have been close to the outside of this craft. They 
but at that point, I didn't really know where I was very disoriented, and I, I was hoping those would be a, a door out of this craft. And uh, the curious thing about this room is that when I entered it, um, um, the closer I got to the middle, the darker it became, and I could see uh, points of light uh, on the walls, floor, ceiling, everything. Um, it was either like you could see through these surfaces or, or it was projected onto there, some kind of a map or a planetarium type situation. But the chair in the middle had um, controls on it, and so uh, my main interest, uh, interest uh, was to try to find a way to open a door, and I was hoping that some of these buttons would uh, open uh, one of these doors. But uh, most of them didn't seem to do anything. Um, nothing that I could detect, but uh, moving the lever caused the uh, star pattern to all shift at once. You know, the stars stayed in the same pattern, but the, the whole thing moved, and that was, I was already unsteady on my feet, and that really gave me vertigo. But, uh, so I was thinking of pushing another one of these buttons, um, and then uh, something caught my attention um, from the door that I had come through, and uh, I saw this man standing there, um, now, from the door, looking over this guy's shoulder, you normally would not see the star pattern because you could really only see that from the from near the chair. At least that's what I was thinking. But you know, it's possible that it just was activated by being near the chair. Anyway, I turned around, I saw him, and I thought, you know, that right off, I thought it was somebody from NASA or Air Force or something, somebody to rescue me from this situation, and uh, so. I took him to be a human rescuer, and I, I ran up to him and started babbling all these questions, and yeah, uh, but he wasn't responding. And I thought, well, maybe it's the helmet, you know, he can't hear me or can't talk with that on. Uh, so I went with him, and uh, he seemed to be in a hurry, and I was pretty weak and uh, unsteady on my feet, but uh, he took me. Um, out of this craft, and at this point, uh, it was parked inside of this large uh, room, um, uh, a hangar-like room, because th there were these glowing panels that curved from one wall up into the ceiling. So it's shaped kind of like a quarter of a cylinder. Uh, but the, the biggest relief was getting outside of this thing. I, the air was fresher and easier to breathe. and. Uh, I tried to look around, but he seemed to be in a hurry and was pulling me along, and I really had to think about my walking because I was still hurting a lot and uh, unsteady on my feet. But there were other craft in there, at least two I, I know for sure, uh, that were disc-shaped but uh, shinier and more rounded. So I don't know whether this was a, a building or part of a larger craft or how long the craft that I was in had been inside of this area. But he hurried me out of this uh, big room uh, down a hallway um, to a room where he left me with some, uh, uh, some people who were dressed like him. And it, it was just a sort of a blue coverall that, uh, without any kind of insignia, no, no flags or uh, rank markings or anything like that. But uh, the fact that these uh, other people didn't have any uh, helmets on made me think that, well, maybe finally somebody can answer my questions. Uh, I'm kind of exaggerating the thinking the part because I was so in total panic and, and my head was so foggy uh, that uh, I wasn't thinking real clear. I was basically uh, hysterical. And so, but I did try to talk to these people and uh, they didn't say a word, not to me or not to each other. They uh, started leading me over and trying to get me to lay down on this table. And I had had enough of these table things, you know. <laughs> but uh, I was so weak and they were so strong that they didn't have too much trouble getting me onto that table. And, but 
uh, one of them uh, appeared to be female, uh, had a, what looked like an oxygen mask that she put over my face. And I was struggling, uh, not too successfully. And uh, I, I did manage to jerk my arm, a uh, hand away, and get it under the edge of the, of the mask. But before I could pull it away, I blacked out. Um, next thing I know, I, I came to, cold air, uh, lying face down. My hand was laying on my arm. I wasn't in the road, but I was uh, enough on the pavement where I wasn't in the, off in the brush. But uh, uh, I saw a light above, and I looked to see where the light was coming from. But it went off before I could see whether, what was actually lit. So it might have been some kind of a light or or a hatch closing or something. But I just saw this silvery, rounded uh, surface hovering above me there. So it wasn't exactly in the middle of the road, kind of partially off to one side. And then it just shot straight up right past the trees. It sort of stirred the leaves around and moved the limbs. But it was silent. It, it shot up, and it was it was it was tiny before, in seconds. Just amazing that something could move that fast without, you know, making a, breaking the sound barrier or something, you know. But I was just relieved that I was back in familiar surroundings. Um, a lot of people wouldn't feel too comfortable being standing alone in the dark in the middle of the woods, but uh, it, was a, it was a big improvement for me. <laughs> I, I looked down and I saw these lights and I, I figured out, I, I recognized the lights of Heber, and uh, that's not where I live. This is the town nearest where it happened, but 15 miles from uh, uh, where the incident occurred. So I don't know where I got the strength. I was a little wobbly when I stood up, but I, uh, you know, ran down into the town uh, looking to get help. First building I came to with lights on, there was smoke coming out of the chimney. I pounded on the door and nobody came. So I went on down. Um, there was probably a closer phone than where I went, but uh, I didn't, I didn't want to go back into the side streets that were, you know, darker. So I ran on down across the second bridge, and I came to a row of telephone booths, <coughs> and I uh, managed to uh, call my family. Um, the first phone booth I came into, though, was, was out of order. And I, you know, I was at the end of my rope, strength-wise, but... Uh, uh, I went into the next phone booth and, and uh, called my brother-in-law, and he thought it was a prank call. He started to hang up on me. Uh, oh, I think you got the wrong number, you know, wise guy. So I, I screamed and made him understand that, uh, you know, it was me. And he seemed kind of stunned, but he says, okay, okay, I'll, I'll get your brother and come and get you. And so to me it seemed like hardly any time at all until the lights of the truck were shining into there and they came and got me out of the bottom of that phone booth where I'd collapsed. But uh, it had to have been at least 30 or 40 minutes, so I was probably unconscious part of that time. But uh, found out later, you know, the skeptics were <laughs> doubtful of everything. They were claiming I was really someplace else, but uh, the sheriff, uh, the, actually the, the phone operator, listened in on the phone call because, you know, you didn't have to have coins to talk to the operator in that part of the country at that time. And so uh, the operator just listened in on the call and, and called the sheriff and reported it. And so the sheriff sent a man out there. But uh, my brother had already taken me away. And uh, I got in the truck and... 
I said something, and he said, uh, because I see, I thought this was still the same night, and uh, he said, Travis, feel your face. It's been five days. But see, I, I, I was trying to tell him what happened. I was talking, and I, I just broke down. I just couldn't get it out. And he said, it's okay, it's okay. He put his arm around me. And, uh, it's kind of, it's kind of extra emotional now because uh, this brother uh, passed away recently. His funeral was Monday, and uh, <sighs> he was there for me, and. Uh, uh, he's, you know, there had there, there, been so much going on, so much controversy, the search and, and all the accusations, all the crank calls and everything. And uh, my brother said, there's no way I'm going to let that crazy mob get a hold of this guy in the shape he's in. And so he didn't, you know, call up the sheriff and hand me over. Plus, you know, there was other reasons. He, he didn't want to just turn me over to the sheriff. Uh, there had been some... Uh, suggestions from people. Uh, there was uh, some ground saucer watch people at the at the site, and they had warned him about what might happen if uh, if I were ever returned. And there were a couple of calls. Uh, one was from a, a nurse that said that she was working in a hospital where an elderly couple had had some kind of a close encounter with something and had been brought in and and. Um, she said when she come back on shift the next night, the, the couple was gone, their records were gone, and everybody was trying to pretend like they hadn't been there. So she, her warning was, you know, uh, be careful who gets a hold of him if, if he ever turns up again. And another guy uh, said he was retired CIA, made a similar warning. And uh, he left uh, his uh, contact information, sounded, you know, like a... Didn't sound like a kook, so my brother was concerned about that, and so he, the main thing he was worried about was was I okay physically, and uh, so he took me to Phoenix, uh, and uh, to his house, and then and then right from there to try to get some medical help. Uh, the first people we uh, hooked up with were recommended by the ground saucer watch people, but turned out to be. Um, not a medical doctor at all. He was actually some kind of a quack, but um, figured that out and left. And so the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization um, uh, figured out where, where I really was, even though my brother was saying I was in a hospital in Tucson. They, they figured it out before the sheriff, apparently. <laughs> and uh, they arranged some uh, medical tests with... Uh, doctors that they had in their uh, Phoenix membership. And uh, there was immediately all kinds of uh, things being raised, um, that I'd had a transitory psychosis, that I, that I only th believed that I'd uh, experienced these things, that it was all a hallucination, that I'd become crazy and then become sane again. And, or that, uh, that it was all a drug hallucination. That was the accusation from the ground saucer watch people because since they weren't getting the investigation and they were jealous of APRO, they uh, attacked. But uh, I had a whole bunch of tests, medical tests and the psychiatric exams that uh, you know, showed a perfectly normal pattern of scores. There were, uh, you know, examinations by psychiatrists that, uh, you know, that I was perfectly normal in that respect. And, and uh, I had blood and urine samples put through the Maricopa County Medical Examiner's drug screen, showed no trace of any drug in my body. And then there was the, the accusation that the hypnotist had planted these memories in me. But uh, what none of these theories took into consideration, consideration is that how, do, how do seven people have the same delusion, you know? It just, it just didn't make any sense, and I just wondered why the, why the press would even take these things seriously, because it didn't explain the facts of the matter at all. And uh, especially not facts to do with, you know, physical traces that were left at the site. The ground saucer watch people themselves had taken um, 
uh, some very strange magnetic readings at the site. They'd gridded the whole area out and took these readings with these Gauss meters, and, and they'd found that there was um, these very high level readings with an actual polarity reversal at one end of the clearing. And uh, um, I heard right off from the men that, um, that the for uh, Forest Service guy had had a Geiger counter. Since then, I've heard that a lot of other people had come out there with Geiger counters and that they'd found uh, high radiation levels uh, at the clearing. But none of that came out at that time. Only, only Mike and the crew you know, reported uh, that some of the high radiation levels were taken off of uh, the equipment, the hard hats that they'd had um, at the time of the incident. But all, all that stuff kind of got covered over in the, in the uh, controversy at the time. But uh, it came out later um, that there had been some pretty dramatic changes in the growth of the trees at the, at the uh, site. Um, there's a um, picture in my book of this core sample from one of the trees. When we went out there to do this um, um, TV show for Paramount, I think it was Inside Edition or Hard Copy, one of those, went out there in the middle of the winter. It was, it was three feet of snow, but they rented these big snow cats so we could get there anyway. And so um, when we finally found the spot, I thought the difficulty in finding the spot was because it was, the snow was so deep. But um, later on, I found out that Mike had gone back and, and uh, checked it out. And he'd found that uh, it was because the trees had grown so rapidly right next to where the uh, craft had come down. Um, this uh, picture here is a, a core sample out of one of those, and you can count the rings uh, backward, which he's marked with a pen there. Um, the, back to the time of the incident, the tree rings were all of a uniform size, but very much thicker. This tree was like 85 years old at, uh, in the winter of 75, November, when it happened, and then here, only 15 or so years later, the tree had doubled in size. Um, and so, you know, they did some calculations and figured out that uh, these trees were producing wood fiber at 36 times uh, the, the rate they had been in the previous nearly 100 years. So, uh, that was pretty interesting. That was something that kind of got overlooked and ignored for quite some time until uh, Linda Howe uh, came to Snowflake. She was in the state for some other business, and so we arranged to take advantage of the trip and go out there, and she was going to collect some, um, some samples, some soil samples and some uh, plant samples and whatnot to, for research. Uh, and uh, on the way out there, we figured out that uh, we were going out there on the exact anniversary of the incident. So that was pretty uh, uh, anxious uh, sort of trip out there. Uh, but we got out of there before dark, and um, <laughs> I was grateful for that. But uh, you know, it's just been a, a whole lot of uh, things that we really don't have time to cover in too great a detail. But, uh, um, there are a lot of interesting things about uh, uh, the attempts to cover it up. Uh, there was one incident. Um, there was a, a guy came to town, a federal criminal investigator, he said. He had this badge and went to Mike and uh, was accusing him of uh, having invented a fictitious character, his brother, uh, who was a partner on one of his contracts. And this, no, he, you know, we're having a family reunion. It's, it so happens at this time. I'll go introduce you to him. So, uh, but it was one thing after another. And finally, this, uh, this guy, he was very aggressive, intimidating. And he wrote up this confession that he tried to force Mike to sign. Mike said, I'm not signing that. I, that's not true. So the guy got very angry and he left. But found out later that he wasn't there about Forest Service contracts because. Uh, that was just the cover story. He'd gone to the sheriff and uh, asked for a copy of the file, which coincidentally disappeared when uh, it came time to uh, 
do a little research for Paramount, they wanted us to go get a copy of the file because, uh, you know, we had the right to do that since it was a closed file. And the uh, sheriff's department said, sure, come back tomorrow, we'll have copies for you. And so uh, Mike went back the next day and they said, sorry, you can't find it, it's gone. So, but I, the sheriff was not in on any cover up there because he uh, had a lot of that stuff in his uh, personal files at home and he gave us some copies of it. That's where I got a lot of information about stuff that went on, uh, that there were people who came to him and reported seeing things from a distance. Uh, and uh, one case in particular, somebody called me and uh, about the, uh, about the time the movie was being made and said that he was out there at the time that the incident happened and that um, he uh, was deer hunting there with his wife and uh, he said his wife would vouch for that even though they were now divorced and uh, that he had been on this next hill and he described the terrain to me, it's rugged back country, there's not really a whole lot of landmarks that you could guide somebody to the exact spot. So I, from his descriptions, I could tell that he had actually been there and he was saying that he saw the glow of the craft and the, the flash of the beam and everything. And I thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, so I called Tracy Torme, who wrote the script for the movie, and told him about it. But we were off traveling around doing all these interviews all over the country, so I didn't give it any more thought. But I found out later that Paramount flew him out to Hollywood and interviewed him and they got suspicious. So they had him uh, polygraphed, and um, he took a polygraph test, actually two of them, from the same one who tested me and the rest of the crew, and the state police polygraph examiner who'd gone into private practice. And uh, very strange results. He, um, he passed the part about being there, about uh, seeing the beam and everything, but see, one of his explanations was that uh, why we, he was coming forward so late, you know. I thought it was cool that we had this independent witness, and he was saying, well, he was in military intelligence at the time, stationed, stationed in Texas, and he'd ask his superior, should I get involved? These guys are accused of murder, and they told him, well, uh, you know, unless they're actually indicted, just stay out of it. And since the men passed the test and they were not indicted, uh, he said he'd always regretted not uh, corroborating uh, by coming forward and telling what he'd seen. So he took this test and he passed the part about seeing the beam and the craft and about being there and be, even about being in military intelligence. Okay. And he takes another test and they're asking him about his connections to the debunkers, this Philip Class guy, and he flunked. He flunked the test on that question, so that was kind of disturbing, you know, somebody from military intelligence, you know, it seems to be having some sort of interaction with the people out to discredit the case. And so, um, uh, I've, uh, you know, that there's some sort of covert uh, government activity in regards to this it, um, increases all the time. I, haven't had too much contact with Mike Rogers, the crew boss, uh, in recent years. We're kind of on the outs, but uh, I talked to him a while back, and he told me that uh, there's been some federal agents uh, harassing him in a variety of ways um, that he's promised to fill me in on, but he says it's still going on. They're still, they're still doing it, which I think is kind of funny. I was, why are they bothering him so much when Maybe, I haven't seen anything. I've had some problems that I wouldn't attribute it to anybody in particular, just problems with my book. Um, can't prove anything one way or the other about that, you know. My first uh, book, The Walton Experience, came out, 50,000 copies sold, boom, just like that. And then all of a sudden I'm getting all these letters from people, oh, where can I get a copy? I can't get one. So I, you know, write to the publisher and ask them, why aren't you printing another copy, uh, another printing? Well, we're not doing that. Either. Okay, all right, well, give me my rights back then. They said, we can't understand why you do want your rights back when there's so much selling life left. Well, if there's no sell, if there's a selling life, how come you won't print and make another printing? So that was kind of curious, so he just dropped it. And then uh, the 1993 book, same kind of a situation, you know? They, the, the, they claimed that 
the book wasn't selling. Well, it, there's, a, there's a lot to go on there. I had some funny goings-ons with uh, an agent that he just kind of dragged his feet and dragged things out and everything. And then I find out that, you know, I, I said, okay, well, never mind, send all that stuff back. And I get everything back except the part about Philip Class. That one little part is missing from the whole thing. Well, wow. You know, that's just a coincidence that that part got lost. A lot of little funny things. Like I say, can't prove anything by that. But I did uh, see a copy of Philip Class's FBI file recently, kind of a real eye-opener, surprised me. Apparently they had investigated him way back and um, in regard to his uh, revealing some classified information. And uh, he was under investigation. They declined not to prosecute, but there's some interesting comments in there that kind of fit in with the whole scenario um, that makes me suspect that basically they had some leverage on him to get him to act as their propagandist. Whether that's the case or not, he certainly was a propagandist. But anyway, you know, I. Um, over the years, um, Alan Dallas and Mike Rogers were retested, repolygraphed. They passed with flying colors. I, I took a test uh, with the, two tests with them at that time, and, and then here a, a couple of years ago, I took another two polygraph tests. So I've passed five different polygraph tests in regard to this matter. But uh, it seems that the questions will never end. And I guess you know, for those who know. Uh, no proof is necessary, and for those who don't want to believe, no amount of proof is ever enough. But um, there's so much more to talk about, but time is running short, so uh, I'll just take a couple of real quick questions because we're about out of time. Okay. Yeah, uh, my book is available here, and it's a new updated edition. It's uh, I ju it just came out a few months ago, and. Um, so when this is over, I'll be back out there at, the, uh, at my table um, in there with everyone else. And so if you have any more questions um, at that time, I'll, I'll be happy to talk to you there. But uh, until they come and pull me away from here, I'll take another question. OK. Okay, the question was, uh, did, was I under their control when I approached the craft? And I did not feel that way. They're telling me I'm out of time, but I'll tell you this. Um, Steve and Alan both said it looked to them like I was in some kind of a trance, like drawn to it like a zombie. But to me, I, I was just en entranced in the, in, the, in the metaphorical sense of, you know, just in awe of this thing and curious about seeing it up close. And, uh, you know, I'll admit there was a little bit of uh, show off there a little bit, but, uh, you know. Uh, I certainly came to regret that. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for coming. Uh, let's talk to you out there.